C-SPAN update today. Up next on C-SPAN, we continue with highlights from the annual conference of the group Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. The next featured speaker is Noam Chomsky, who's Professor of Linguistics and Philosophy at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, in the entire United States, there are only two uh, critics of the media that have even the most minimal um, uh, public recognition uh, and acknowledgement by the mass media um, and they're both here today. One, one is Alex Coburn who um, for, in terms of fairness and accuracy and reporting would like it to be known that he's an Irishman and not an Englishman. <laughs> and the other is Noam Chomsky. Um, Uh, Noam, uh, um, before all of us heard of him, uh, was the, um, uh, the foremost, what is and is, the foremost linguistic expert in the world, uh, a groundbreaking theor theorist and theoretician, um, who um, uh, found time to switch, uh, switch a good deal of his scholarly endeavors into um, uh, analysis of the U.S. government behavior abroad, the U.S. government manipulation of uh, 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 propaganda, of the mass media, and, um, uh, and the impact on, um, uh, on the consciousness both here, on policy here, and the consciousness, and on policy abroad. Uh, he's, he's written um, about Israel in the, in the Faithful Triangle, which was about Israel, um, Palestine, and, um, and the United States. He's written on Central America. Um, uh, uh, he's written on um, the use of uh, 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 the mass media, its use of terrorism as a, as a reinforcement of U.S. policy. I would say this, from my knowledge of his work, is that he's done the absolute best homework of uh, anybody I know about and the most trenchant uh, scholarly criticism uh, he's a one-man walking Columbia Journalism Review. In fact, is the Columbia Journalism Review could well go out of business and be replaced by Noam Chomsky for all, for all, for all, the, for all the real uh, good work that it does. Um, so um, uh, he, uh, his own request is he simply be, asked, be introduced as a, a professor from MIT who, uh, who cares about the things he covers. And, that's, and that, with that, I introduce you to Noam Chomsky. Let me uh, begin with a recent article by New York Times uh, columnist Anthony Lewis in which he defends the media against the charge that they've become too independent and too powerful for the public good. Uh, he writes that the press is protected by the First Amendment, not for its own sake, but to enable a free political system to operate. In the end, the concern is not for the reporter or the editor but for the citizen critic of government. What's at stake when we speak of freedom of press, he says, is the freedom to perform a function on the behalf of the polity. Uh, Lewis goes on to cite Supreme Court justices and other judges who observe, these are all quotes, that no individual can obtain for himself the, in the information needed for the intelligent discharge of his political responsibilities by enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process the press performs a crucial function in affecting the societal purpose of the First Amendment. Therefore, quotes, a, cant a, a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquit ubiquitous press must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. 
Uh, now, I do not think that we should accept the view that freedom of expression has to be defended in instrumental terms by virtue of its contribution to some higher good, rather it's a value in itself. But that apart, these ringing declarations do express valid aspirations, and they surely express the general uh, self-image of the American media. Now, the question is, what's the relation between that self-image and the facts? The facts seem to me to show something rather different. Namely, in contrast to the conception of the media as cantankerous, obstinate, obstinate and ubiquitous in their search for truth and their independence of authority, the actual evidence appears to show with quite considerable clarity that the media do serve a societal purpose, but not that of enabling the public to assert meaningful control over the political process by providing them with the information that's needed for the intelligent discharge of political responsibilities, as was just quoted. On the contrary, the actual societal purpose which the media serve very effectively, is to inculcate and defend the economic, uh, social, and political agenda of privileged groups that dominate the domestic society and the state. The media serve this societal purpose in many ways through selection of topics, distribution of concerns, framing of issues, filtering of information, emphasis, and tone. I think we should agree with Chief Justice Hughes, whom Lewis also cites, on the primary need of a vigilant and courageous press if democratic processes are to function in a meaningful way. But the evidence shows clearly enough that this need is not met or even weakly approximated uh, in actual practice. Now, the reasons for the overwhelming tendencies which I'm describing, they are overwhelming tendencies. You can find uh, a deviation here and there, but the reasons for the overwhelming tendencies uh, in a ful fulfillment of this actual societal purpose, these reasons are not particularly obscure on uh, essentially guided free market assumptions that are not at all controversial. Uh, simply think about what the private media are. In essence, the private media are major corporations uh, that have a market, namely other businesses called advertisers, and they sell a product, namely readers and audiences, uh, to these other businesses. From, a, from an institutional point of view, that's what the corporate media are. Uh, furthermore, the national media, uh, the ones that are most influential in setting the general political agenda and so on, they typically target and they serve elite opinion, uh, groups which on the one hand provide an optimal profile, as it's called, for advertising purposes, uh, and therefore maximize revenue, uh, and on the other hand, uh, play a role in decision-making and in the private and the public spheres. The national media would be failing to meet their elite audience's needs if they did not pr uh, present a tolerably realistic portrayal of the world, but their societal purpose also requires that the media's interpretation of the world ref reflect the interests and concerns of the sellers, the buyers, and the institutions dominated by these groups, in particular the state, whatever segment of the business classes happens to be in control of the state at a particular moment. So it's not surprising that um, this societal purpose should be fulfilled with such uh, uh, dramatic success. Uh, in these terms, we can also understand another pervasive phenomena, namely the way in which media personnel adapt to the institutional demands. Conformity to the needs and interests of privileged sectors is simply essential to success. In the media, as in other major institutions, those who do not display the requisite values and perspectives will be regarded as irresponsible, uh, ideological, or otherwise aberrant, and they'll fall by the wayside. Now, there'll be a small number of exceptions, but the pattern is pervasive and, and accepted, expected. Uh, those who adapt, and perhaps quite honestly so, those who adapt will then be able, they'll be perfectly free to express themselves with uh, essentially no managerial control, and they'll be able to assert quite accurately that they perceive no pressures to conform. The media are indeed free for those who adopt the principles required for their societal purpose. Now, there may be some who are simply corrupt, uh, who serve as uh, errand boys for the state and other authority. The, the description of New York Times correspondent Stephen Kinzer by Edgar Chamorro, who was selected by the CIA as a press spokesman for the Contras. But that's not the norm. Uh, 
the, the media form part of a larger intellectual community where institutional factors induce similar effects, and they do so in the same manner through the normal workings of power. Uh, one immediate prediction from these rather natural assumptions is that nothing that I'm now saying could be understood within the general culture. The reason is that to fulfill their societal purpose, responsible intellectuals must conceal from their, themselves and from others uh, what their societal function is. Otherwise, that function cannot be fulfilled. So it follows, uh, it follows that one could demonstrate quite conclusively with a huge weight of evidence dealing with every imaginable topic that the mass media do serve the societal purpose of safeguarding power and privilege, but these results could not be understood. In fact, the words could barely be heard. Uh, this prediction, too, is very well confirmed. There's by now a huge mass of evidence in print demonstrating that the media serve their actual societal purpose. The effect of all of that is zero, and I think we could be certain that the evidence, that the, the effect would remain zero, even if the standards of proof uh, reached those of physics or even su surpassed them. There's a good institutional reason for that. Now, the media, in fact, delight in the right-wing jingoist critique that they go too far in their adversarial stance. Uh, that provides the occasion for solemn declarations on the need for a cantankerous and obstinate press in a functioning democracy. And furthermore, the criticisms are usually so totally ludicrous that they can be easily refuted. But an accurate description of the media as subservient and conformist is literally unintelligible, uh, and the evidence simply cannot be considered, which makes perfect sense. Again, it's completely explicable on normal grounds of simple institutional analysis. Just to give one example, uh, there's a recent book called Reporters Under Fire, edited by Landrum Balling, uh, which is concerned with U.S. media coverage of uh, the United States and of uh, Middle East and Central America. Now, uh, it, it contains a critique of the uh, media as anti-Israel, as unfair to the United States and its noble endeavors. Uh, it also contains a refutation of that critique, but barely a word uh, suggesting that a rather different interpretation might be conceivable, and uh, that's very typical and also entirely natural. That's exactly what any reasonable person should expect, looking at the way the society is constructed and it works. Well, let me give one concrete example uh, of how these things work out. Uh, I've done a number of uh, analytic studies of the media in Central America. Um, I'll keep to that topic. We could pick any other one, but let's keep to Central America. Uh, and these are very revealing. So let me just mention one. Uh, I'll come back to another later. Uh, this one deals with the New York Times and the Washington Post, the two national media, uh, uh, at a crucial moment of debate over Central America, namely the first three months of uh, 1986, when everything was peaking towards the Contra vote, and the amount of attention, in fact, peaked. Uh, I reviewed all the opinion columns. That means uh, their own columnists uh, invited op-eds and so on. And the point was to determine the range of expressible opinion. The point was not to evaluate particular contributions. Anybody can say what they like, but the question is, what's the range of opinion that's expressible? Now, there's a prediction that comes out that you, will immediately come to mind. The prediction would be that the range of expressible opinion will conform closely or exactly to the, spect to the spectrum of tactical disagreement among elite groups. And that, in fact, is precisely verified. Let's first look at the elite groups. There is a tactical disagreement about the best way to, as they put it, contain Nicaragua or restore Nicaragua to the Central American mode or restore regional standards. I'm now quoting the liberal Washington Post at the dovish end. Uh, now, notice a few points. Uh, one of them is that on the assumptions that are expressed at the dovish end, as here, if the policy of violence and terror were to succeed, then it would apparently be okay. At least there's no indication to the contrary. Uh, second point, notice that there's no need, according from this point of view, the dovish point of view, to enforce any arrangement on Guatemala and El Salvador, where the military are happily slaughtering their civilian populations, or on Hondur Honduras, 
where hundreds of thousands of peasants at that time and still were starving to death while the country exports food. Apparently that's okay. In fact, that is the Central American mode, so we don't have to say anything about it. Uh, notice, third point, notice that there's no need, it seems, to enforce any arrangement on the United States, despite a certain amount of evidence that the U.S. government record on adherence to international law and to treaties may have an occasional flaw to it. Well, that's the dovish end in the media. What about the corresponding debate in Congress? Uh, again, we find pretty much the same spectrum. So just sampling the dovish end again, let's, since we're in California, take uh, the liberal dove, Alan Cranston. Uh, at that, he explained in Senate testimony at exactly that time that uh, Reagan's resort to violence had proven inadequate. Uh, so therefore, I'm quoting him now, we should isolate the reprehensible government of the, Mar of, uh, the Marxists in Managua and leave it to fester in its own juices. In contrast, uh, Pol Pot-style terror in El Salvador and Guatemala, which is uh, backed or directly organized by the United States, uh, that merits no such recommendations. We don't have to let them fester in their own juices. In fact, we should continue to support them uh, in accordance with this critic, who again is about at the outer limits of dissent. Uh, well, that uh, samples just the dovish extreme. From there it goes over to the hawks. Uh, uh, coming back to the, uh, there, there is then, there was at that time, there remains tactical debate among elites, uh, but there also is a consensus, and that's uh, also clearly reflected in the 85 columns. The consensus has a number of properties to it. For one thing, the consensus is obviously you've got to be anti-Sandinista, uh, and in fact, out of 85 columns, 85 were anti-Sandinista, most of them harshly so, some less harshly. Uh, that means 100% conformity on the major issue. That's a considerable victory for the Office of Public Diplomacy of the State Department and Operation Truth, as they called it. So that's part of the elite consensus. You're only in the debate if you accept certain assumptions. Uh, second uh, point has to do with some of the differences between Nicaragua and, uh, uh, say, El Salvador, the other relevant states, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Actually, there's more to say about Costa Rica than people believe, but let's put it aside. So let's just talk about Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. There's one striking difference between Nicaragua and the others. Uh, one, the most striking difference is that of those four, Nicaragua is the only one that doesn't slaughter its own population. Now, how many, how many columns discuss that? Well, the answer is zero. There's not one word in 85 columns referring to that distinction. Uh, which again reflects the elite consensus. Third, uh, there's, a, there's another striking difference between Guatemala and the other states, and that is, as is not controversial, uh, the, between Nicaragua and the other states, uh, it's not controversial that in the early phases of the Sandinista revolution, they did direct resources to social reform with rather dramatic success, in fact, until uh, U.S. violence succeeded in uh, restoring them to the Central American mode, or so it's hoped. Uh, so how many references, and that's unique in that respect, how many references are there to that? Well, in 85 columns, there are in fact two phrases referring to that fact. Uh, there are zero phrases referring to uh, successful economic development prior to the U.S. attack, although there's no doubt that it took place. In fact, they had the highest growth rate in Latin America with uh, increase in production of subsistence crops and so on. Uh, there's no reference to the reports of charitable development agencies such as Oxfam or to the World Bank or the International Amer uh, uh, Inter-American Development Bank or other sources which would in fact uh, uh, explain and discuss these things. They're just uh, not part of the debate. Uh, well, all of this reflects a number of things. First of all, it reflects the unimportance of mass slaughter, social reform, uh, economic development, and so on uh, as compared with what's really important and crucial, namely restoring Nicaragua to the Central American mode, as illustrated, say, in the two U.S. terror states or in Honduras. Uh, uh, furthermore, it reflects uh, an elite consensus on enforcing regional arrangements on Nicaragua and Nicaragua alone. Now, you take a look at the 85 columns, there are a few nuances, and when I discussed it in print, there's some comments about that, but that's the general picture very accurately. Well, that study was actually brought to Tom Wicker's attention by, by some reader, and he expressed his reaction to it on December 31st, 1987, where he reviewed his possible errors over the year. And he has this, 
a statement to make about the study, which I doubt that he's ever seen. Uh, he says, criticism by foot rule or calculator is often as simplistic as the reportage it purports to measure. Now that's an interest, that's a total comment. It's an interesting comment. Now there could be things wrong with the study, like maybe the facts are wrong, or maybe it's a badly chosen sample, or maybe used the wrong methodology or whatever, but those are not the criticisms. The criticism is just don't study that topic. It's not a legitimate topic. Uh, any possible rational analysis of the media is off, is improper and illegitimate. Uh, that's essentially the meaning of that. Uh, 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 you can't discuss the way the media satisfy their uh, uh, societal function. No analysis is permissible. Uh, there are a few other comments which I won't review, but that's the core of it. Well, you take a look at that and think about it, and you see very clearly the kinds of defense mechanisms that, the, uh, that uh, prevent even, in this case, probably the most dissident journalists uh, within the permissible spectrum, that is, uh, from uh, facing any rational analysis of the system uh, within which they fulfill their societal function. That reflects what I said before. Some kinds of critiques simply aren't intelligible. They're unacceptable. Uh, they uh, escape the principles of the ideological system, and therefore you can't hear them. Uh, I might mention here that if any of those of you who are interested in intellectual history will notice that this degree of blindness and thought control goes far beyond, say, the period of uh, the medieval period. Uh, medieval theologians, say Thomas Aquinas, they felt they had to listen to heresy. In fact, they had to respond to it. They had to analyze it and figure out answers and so on. Now we've achieved a much higher degree of thought control. You just can't hear it. It's enough to say maybe, you know, criticism can be wrong. That ends the discussion. Uh, well, let me mention a second study, this one unpublished yet. Uh, this one deals with the first six months of 1987. Same two newspapers, Washington Post, New York Times, again covering all opinion pieces, uh, columnists and uh, invited uh, uh, op-ed writers. Uh, and in, that, in those six months, there were 61 relevant to U.S. policy in Nicaragua. Now, those 61, 13 prefer negotiations to, you remember, at, we're now at a point where elite opinion, guys who own the place and run the show, is very much against contra aid, preferring other means of restoring the Central American mode. So of the 61, 13 prefer negotiations to contra aid and say nothing about the Sandinistas. That leaves 48 that expressed some kind of opinion about Nicaragua. Of the 48, 46 were anti-Sandinista, 18 of them pro-Contra, 28 anti-Contra, uh, primarily on the grounds that the Contras are inept and can't win, or that the, I'm quoting now, the U.S. goal of forcing Nicaragua into the American democratic mold is not worth the risk. That's John Oakes at the extreme of dissent. So we now have two of 48 that expressed some sympathy for the Sandinistas. One was by the Nicaraguan ambassador, Carlos Tunerman, who was allowed to write a column, so we can dispense with that, which means, in fact, one. Uh, and that one was by Dr. Uh, Kevin Cahill, uh, the director of the Tropical Disease Center at uh, Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, who happens to be the only commentator who could draw upon personal experience in Nicaragua and elsewhere in the third world. His was only, also the only column among 61 that took note of the successful Nicaraguan health and literacy programs and what he calls the struggle against oppression waged under conditions of extreme adversity imposed by U.S. terror. Cahill's is also one of the two contributions among 61 that mention the world court decision. There are two others, one by Tunerman that have a kind of an oblique reference to international law. Now that fact's also interesting. It reflects the attitude towards international law and a terrorist superpower. Uh, we read there that the, in these columns that the United States is working through the Contras to restore democracy to Nicaragua uh, and to break the Sandinistas' Cuban and Soviet ties and that Washington's role is to help contain the spread of the Sandinista revolution beyond Nicaragua. That's the editors of the liberal Washington Post uh, who prefer taking a chance on reining in the Sandinistas by political development rather than by military assault and were treated to charges of, uh, quoting now again, genocide of the Mosquito Indians, that's William Buckley, who concedes that the Sandinistas have not yet reached the level of Pol Pot, but they're plainly heading that way. But apart from uh, Cahill, 
we read not one word about the constructive policies that were successfully pursued and that in fact in the real world uh, elicited U.S. terror to rein in the Sandinistas. The truism that the United that U.S. policies compelled the reliance on the Soviet Union and were explicitly designed with that goal, that's far beyond the realm of discussion, just as even the harshest critics cannot question that the United States is working to establish or even to restore democracy, which must be a reference to the Somoza period if words have any meaning at all. Uh, now, one should not be confused by the fact that there is tactical debate in the media. Obviously, there's going to be tactical un under the, if the media are going to perform their societal function of serving power and privilege, they'd better have debate over just those issues which are, uh, are under, uh, w which reflect different tactical options, and they do. But much more significant and intriguing, much more important for people who want to understand how indoctrination and ideological warfare are carried out is the shared consensus. And that's very striking. In fact, these examples, which are quite typical, illustrate the astonishing conformity to state doctrine among those segments of U.S. opinion that are permitted expression in the free press. Again, tactical debate within the framework of approved doctrine is permitted, even encouraged, but nothing more, and the exceptions are very, very marginal. Well, these same conclusions you'll find anywhere you turn. Pick your topic and you'll find them. Uh, so let's consider uh, what's lively now, the fate of the Central American Accords, the ones that were signed, the so-called RAS plan, though that's misleading, uh, the accords that were signed in Guatemala City in, on, in August. Now, the U.S. responded to those accords, namely it responded by sharply increasing the attack against Nicaragua. At that time, uh, U.S. CIA supply flights to the Contras were already, had already reached the phenomenal level of about one a day. Uh, they were doubled in October and apparently virtually tripled in November, so they reached the level of two to three a day. Uh, the goal was to escalate the conflict and to prevent Nicaragua from relaxing its guard so that loyal journalists could uh, deplore Sandinista totalitarianism. Uh, that, uh, the, the Accords... Uh, discuss, identified one indispensable element for peace in the region, namely that aid to insurgent and irregular forces cease. Uh, uh, so we may ask the question, uh, how much discussion was there of this massive un, uh, attack on the Accords and the Peace Treaty? I found, uh, I did a review of the press on this, appears in the first issue of Zeta magazine a couple weeks ago, and I found, in fact, a handful of, ex of phrases uh, throughout the whole press during the first three months phase of the Accords, and little enough afterwards, although there was incidentally some remarkable falsification in an effort to cover up the facts. For example, the New York Times, uh, uh, when Daniel Ortega came to the OAS meeting in Washington in November, mid-November, uh, he made reference to supply flights, uh, and uh, 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 Contra leader Adolfo Calero was then asked by the press whether what he thought about that reference to 140 supply flights, and he boasted that the, num the actual number was far higher than that. Uh, had the Times respond to that? At this, up to this point, it, as far as I can see, it never mentioned the fact that there were supply that CIA had es escalated supply flights and barely mentioned that they existed. The Times reacted by replacing the phrase supply flights by surveillance flights in both statements. Notice that surveillance flights are still a violation of international law in the Accords, but a less severe violation, and therefore apparently more tolerable in the, news, in the newspaper of record. Now, the two major reasons why these crucial facts have to be marginalized or, in fact, virtually totally suppressed, first, they would demonstrate that the United States has played by far the major role uh, in disrupting the Accords. Nobody else even comes close. Secondly, they would reveal the completely unacceptable fact that the Contras do not bear even a remote resemblance to guerrillas. Now, if you look at the military analyses in the press, you'll see this is conceded all the time. So Bernard Trainer, for example, who's a military co correspondent of the Times a couple of days ago, uh, points out what everybody knows, that if supply flights to the Contras don't go on at this level, they probably will not be able to survive. Uh, in contrast, indigenous guerrillas, authentic guerrillas, say in El Salvador, the, in, in the guerrillas in El Salvador, actually resist a far more formidable military force than the Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan army, without several supply flights a day, or in fact without any known aid from abroad. Now, it's a crucial element of U.S. propaganda 
repeated almost daily by the uh, more dutiful journalists. James Lemoyne of the Times is notable in this regard. It's a crucial element of the propaganda system that there's what they call a symmetry between uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua, where each one is facing a guerrilla insurrection with popular support. So therefore, the facts must naturally be suppressed, as they are, very effectively. Uh, the careful reader, you know, really fanatic reader, reads the whole press, could learn that CIA flights had increased so substantially since the accords were signed that the Contras are, I'm quoting, burying the equipment in their areas of operation, enabling them to fight even if the U.S. military airdrops cease. Uh, that's preparation in case Congress doesn't go along in a few days. This report, November 24th, in Newsday was considered important enough to make the Washington Post on a back page, but the facts are not sufficiently important to suggest that the U.S. may be playing a role in undermining the Accords, or to raise questions about the relation between these determined efforts to sabotage the Accords and the much maligned Nicaraguan emergency regulations uh, while the country is under attack by a terrorist superpower. Only the most careful reader will be aware that the International Commission of Verification supported the Nicaraguan position that the state of emergency need not be ended until the aggression ceases, and even the careful reader would be very likely, probably not know, that the National Assembly in uh, Nicaragua in November passed a law that decreed a complete amnesty and revoked the state of emergency. Both laws, I'm quoting from the legislation, to go into effect on the date that the International Verification and Follow-up Commission, created in the Guatemala City Accords, conducts the appropriate on-site verification, certifi certifying compliance with the commitments of the Accord uh, to terminate the attack against Nicaragua. If you bother to look back at the Accords, you will notice that these laws passed by the Nicaraguan Assembly uh, are, are ex exactly in the terms of the Accords, which means that in November, Nicaragua had, had complied with the Accords, uh, 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 despite the uh, uh, escalating U.S. war, the vast increase in CIA supply flights. In this respect, it was radically different than Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, El Salvador. That fact is unacceptable, and therefore it just isn't a fact. As far as I know, that was never even reported. Now, the media do make occasional oblique reference to the failure of the United States to lend adequate support to the Accords. But look carefully at how they do it. Uh, they don't mention the blatant violations in progress, namely the rapid escalation of the already phenomenal level of uh, CIA supply flights to keep the proxy army in the field. Rather, what they typically refer to as the plans of the Reagan administration to request contra aid. Now, that's an intelligent form of deceit. It makes it appear that the press is balanced. You know, it's criticizing the U.S. government but it conceals the ongoing actions that are far and away the most serious disruption of the Accords, and it refers simply to plans. Well, plans can later be justified by the alleged failures of the uh, reprehensible Sandinistas to comply, of course, as a result of the escalating U.S. attack, which is designed for this purpose. Uh, the actual facts are entirely unacceptable to the U.S. government and are therefore, were therefore ignored or concealed in the free press. Coming up to uh, more recent times, the New York Times on January 10th published its own comprehensive review of the Accords in the magazine section. That was January 10th. There were two articles, one by James Lemoyne on the conflict between Arias and his adversary Daniel Ortega. The other was by Stephen Kinzer asking whether Ortega can be trusted. That's the whole issue. Uh, nowhere is there one word in those two articles referring to the actions of the U.S. government to ensure that the Accords cannot be fulfilled, uh, although these actions were by far the most serious violation of the Accords, putting in the shade even the very significant violations in the U.S. terror states. Uh, questions about the two U.S. terror states and the client state of Honduras arose only marginally in conformity with State Department priorities. The Times, for example, would not deign to report uh, that uh, Archbishop Rivera Idamas uh, in early January, Arch uh, Salvadoran Archbishop, once again denounced the practice of torture used against many Salvadorans by the death squads, quoting, adding that bishops in several provinces were reporting increased death squad killings and calling for an end to death, squ uh, to death squad killings and torture. 
uh, nor did it report that according to Western diplomats cited by Reuters, Reuters on the day of this review, uh, the Contras are hiding in the jungles of Honduras to avoid exposing the government support for U.S. funded Contras. However, those, that kind of suppression is insignificant as compared with the suppression of the violent escalation of the U.S. attack, which is far and away the most serious uh, step that was taken to uh, uh, undermine the possibility that the Accords could proceed. Now, coming back to these two articles, we now have New York Times Magazine survey of the status of the Accords, two articles on Nicaragua. Uh, Lemoyne gives an account of Arias, Costa Rica's Arias, which is intended to be laudatory, but in fact, if you read it carefully and think about it, he depicts Arias as an opportunist and a moral monster uh, who is unconcerned over terror in El Salvador and Guatemala and is unconcerned over the horrible conditions that persist in Honduras or the fact that all three states are effectively under military rule backed by the United States and is unconcerned by the terrorism of the U.S. proxy army attacking Nicaragua. Uh, that's one article. We turn to the other one, uh, the companion article by Stephen Kinzer. Uh, that denounces Ortega for numerous sins, for example, for running fraudulent elections. That's a staple of U.S. government, uh, hence the free press, always untroubled by fact. Now, as usual, Kinzer cites uh, opposition figures, but also, since he's balanced, he cites one person who he identifies as an old friend of Ortega, and he's permitted to say that Ortega has regressed and no longer reads writers and philosophers, uh, as distinct from Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, uh, who was, you know... Okay. Uh, well, these two pieces, which I've adequately surveyed, they represent the entire coverage of the Accords in the magazine section, which is a notal, not another notable contribution to the state propaganda system. Notice that that conforms precisely to the government agenda. I probably asked them, they're both against contra aid, but that's not the point. The point is they're enforcing the elite consensus, uh, the agenda of those who have power. On the same day, Lemoyne had a front page article uh, reporting, quoting them all, all the way through, that the prospects for peace in Central America appear bleak, the fault of the Sandinistas, overwhelmingly. Now, for balance, he criticizes the Reagan administration for planning renewed aid for the U.S. guerrillas in Nicaragua. That continues with the standard pretense that the proxy army are guerrillas and typically suppresses the far more important fact that the administration has acted, not just planned, to disrupt the accords. Uh, he goes on to condemn the Soviet Union for backing Nicaragua's growing army and supporting Marxist guerrillas in the region, offering no evidence for the latter charge, and ignoring the fact that Nicaragua is, after all, under increasing U.S. attack and that all other sources of aid were consciously blocked by, the US, by U.S. pressure. Continuing, he says both Nicaragua and El Salvador have what he calls civil conflicts, uh, both of the Times twins constantly refer to this. Uh, but El Salvador, he says, is in a stronger position than Nicaragua because it held direct talks with the guerrillas and, I'm quoting, permitted the leaders of the rebel civilian wing uh, to return from exile to hold several public meetings in El Salvador. Uh, while, he goes on to say, the rebels in El Salvador have enjoyed nearly open access to the press. That's a statement so phenomenal I won't even comment on it. Uh, neither here nor anywhere uh, has Lemoyne or his colleagues, to my knowledge, ever reported that opposition groups in, in Nicaragua that openly support the U.S. attack against Nicaragua and openly identify themselves with the Contras function perfectly freely, uh, not requiring an international ex uh, uh, escort to protect them from uh, assassination on a brief visit and needing no bulletproof vests, uh, and they publish a major journal uh, that's... Uh, uh, funded by the superpower that's attacking Nicaragua, a journal which openly and explicitly identifies itself with the Contras and serves, uh, that's true in fact, uh, and serves as an instrument of U.S. disinformation in the country. Now this fact, to my knowledge, is entirely without historical precedent. I don't think you can find anything that comes even close to it. Certainly there's nothing in U.S. history. Or to take a current case, take, say, Israel, faced with much less of a threat, 
constantly closing newspapers. In fact, when La Prensa was suspended, Israel closed two newspapers. When La Prensa was opened, Israel closed another newspaper, this one of them in Nazareth, and also closed the Palestinian News Service. And the reasons were given, this was just endorsed by the High Court a couple of days ago, goes to the Supreme Court, High Court, and they say, well, uh, we certainly have freedom of expression, but it cannot be used to harm the state of Israel. And no government, they say, uh, will allow a business, however legitimate, uh, that's functioning, that's supported by some uh, hostile power. And the security forces claim without evidence that these uh, journals are supported or related to a foreign power. This is never reported in the United States. Uh, I've never seen any report outside of Alex Coburn, who I don't count as part of the United States. Uh, and what that shows is that the alleged concern over freedom of the press in Nicaragua uh, is simply a form of total fraud and hypocrisy. It's a form of ideological warfare, uh, just as when some communist front organization uh, deplores the uh, human rights violations in the United States uh, and in its domains. Well, coming back to Lemoyne, he states that Nicaragua did not lift its state of siege law, did not offer a full political amnesty, although faced with a similar war, that is a statement that is utterly nonsensical, faced with a similar war, El Salvador did so. That's a completely deceitful rendition of the actual facts for the reasons I already mentioned, uh, quite apart from the fact that the Salvadoran amnesty was in explicit violation of the terms of the accords and has been bitterly condemned by human rights groups who have repeatedly called for it to be rescinded. Continue with Lemoyne, particularly damaging for Nicaragua, he, he goes on, are the Miranda revelations, which he misrepresents, claiming falsely, I'm quoting him, that the Sandinistas defend the government's right to form a large army and to assess, assist rebel groups in El Salvador. A total lie. Most interestingly, uh, Lemoyne goes on to quote uh, Elliot Abrams, who insists that Nicaragua must be held the most responsible for the treaty's lack of, a, of success. You'll notice that that's an order that's loyally followed by Lemoyne and his Times colleagues, and in fact, the free press generally. Well, a closer look at these uh, triumphs of voluntary totalitarianism is actually instructive. Uh, notice that there's a unanimous agreement among our near unanimous agreement among articulate elites in the United States that uh, Nicaragua must not obtain the means to defend its territory from the CIA supply flights that are required to keep the uh, uh, U.S. proxy army in the field. I might add that the question of illegal U.S. surveillance flights, uh, which are required to coordinate contra attacks, enabling them to evade the Nicaraguan army and attack what are called soft targets in accordance with State Department orders, uh, that's far beyond the possibility of discussion in the free press. Now, all of this is extremely clear, and it's a very revealing fact. It teaches us a lot about our political culture. It's well understood that uh, to defend its territory from constant U.S. attack, Nicaragua must obtain jet uh, interceptors. There's no other way. And therefore, no one familiar with the U.S. political culture would be surprised at all to discover that the most severe charge against the Sandinistas, the ultimate proof that they must be destroyed, is the allegation that they're attempting to obtain such aircraft. Any indication that Nicaragua might be attempting to obtain vintage 1950s jet planes uh, from the Soviet Union, the United States having blocked all other sources of supply, that elicits almost hysterical outrage. In fact, what's happening is that Nicaragua is threatening to defend its own territory against U.S. attack. And it's an unchallengeable principle of U.S. doctrine that the United States must be free to attack any country that it likes. And it's intolerable and unspeakable scandal, if not outright aggression, for any country, however weak, to defend itself, to try to defend itself from U.S. attack. Notice that that's precisely the meaning of the constant hysteria about Soviet MiGs. There's no other meaning to that. Uh, and it uh, tells us a great deal about the elite policy consensus and, in fact, about the reigning culture more generally. Well, all of these things came to the fore during the Miranda affair. Uh, as you recall, I think it was already discussed, so I won't go on with it. There was, in fact, only one revelation uh, by Miranda that merited even five words in the press, and that was that the U.S. government had been lying about the level of Soviet and Cuban advisors, uh, which was far lower, as he revealed, 
than had been claimed by the United States and was roughly in accord with Nicaraguan reports. But the, all of that is such a familiar pattern that little attention was warranted, and in fact it was barely reported, though presumably not for that reason. Uh, in fact, there was a huge press barrage aiming to show that uh, Managua is threatening, I'm quoting, to overwhelm and terrorize its neighbors, that's the Washington Post. And suddenly that same Post editorial observed that Nicaragua will be a prime place to test the sanguine forecast that Gorbachev is now turning down the heat in the third world. Notice that that places the onus for the U.S. attack against Nicaragua on the Russians. It's a pretty neat trick, a uh, very common and impressive achievement of free press agitprop. Well, the factual basis for these impassioned charges, which was echoed, were echoed widely through the media, was, as you know, that, Mor that uh, Miranda stated that Nicaragua's attempt, uh, and the Ortega brothers and, uh, repeated, that Nicaragua was planning to reduce its military forces and to provide light armaments for the population for defense against a possible U.S. invasion, thereby creating a nation in arms on the model of Israel, for example, though at a far lower level. Uh, uh, as, well, Defense Minister Ortega stated in remarks that were transmuted in a most miraculous way as they passed through the filter of the free press, he stated, it is not our intention to be an offensive army capable of attacking another country. We simply want to have all modern weapons needed to defend our country. Now, to convert those statements uh, into a threat to overwhelm and terrorize Central America, that's an achievement, even for the free press, uh, which went on to exalt that with Soviet help, I'm quoting Lemoyne again, with Soviet help, they planned to build a reserve army of more than half a million men, the purpose being to ensure that the party will continue to control much of Nicaragua. Notice that the purpose is not to defend Nicaragua from eventual U.S. invasion. In fact, we know that, Lemoyne explains, defense against possible U.S. aggression cannot be the motive for arming the population because he simply asserts as definite fact, quote, the United States will not in, uh, invade Nicaragua, and that settles that issue. It's therefore only a cover for totalitarianism when Nicaragua's population is mobilized while the U.S. escalates the attack against Nicaragua and carries out regular, constant, large-scale military maneuvers on its border, and there's certainly no reason for Nicaragua to pay any attention uh, when high American officials comment that they expect that, I'm quoting, the end result of the RAS peace plan will be to increase the likelihood of a U.S. invasion of Nicaragua. It's also quoted by Lemoyne, whose capacity for self-refutation appears to be unlimited. Well, still another stunning revelation of the Miranda affair was that Nicaragua was planning to obtain jet planes uh, to defend its territory from the escalating U.S. attack and intolerable outrage, as I've already mentioned. And so Nicaragua has made it clear repeatedly that they would be delighted to, uh, to uh, uh, obtain French Mirage jets, for example, but that fact can't be reported. Uh, the reason is it would give the game away, and it would also undermine the ominous references to the Soviet-supplied Sandinistas, which are necessary to keep the domestic population in line. So Stephen Kinzer, for example, has to be able to report, quoting him, that Miranda's dramatic revelations included documents outlining Soviet plans to continue expanding the Sandinista army through 1995, uh, that is, Nicaraguan plans to defend themselves with supplies from the only source that the United States will permit. Well, it's a, very, it's a, it's a rather striking fact that in the midst of all of these, this carefully orchestrated furor over these outrageous Sandinista plans to try to defend themselves from U.S. attack, right in the middle of that, uh, on December 15th, the United States began shipping uh, F-5 jet planes to Honduras. That fact was literally not reported by the New York Times, apart from subsequent reference uh, in quotes from Ortega and Arias that was buried in articles on other, on other matters. Well, in still another rather intriguing propaganda coup, uh, James Lemoyne, among others, announced that in response to Miranda's charges, Defense Minister Ortega, I'm quoting him, seemed indirectly to confirm the existence of Sandinista assistance to the Salvadoran rebels. Uh, you take a look at what Ortega actually said, and what he said is, we are not aiming arming the Salvadoran rebels. He said the Salvadoran guerrillas have some resources and ways to get weapons. They are armed through their own efforts, not depending on outside sources. They are self-sufficient. That became, in the free press, an admission 
uh, that the Sandinistas are assisting the Salvadoran rebels. I leave it, leave it to some logician to figure out how that one works. Uh, this allegation of uh, Nicaraguan support for the Salvadoran rebel, rebels, that's pretty important for Lemoyne because one of his major doctrines is that Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala are quite alike in that they all face what he calls externally backed guerrilla war. Now that's a crucial element of Washington propaganda, so therefore it is the duty of the free press to insist upon the claim no matter how absurd it may be. Now even James Lemoyne's vivid imagination can't conjure up KGB supply flights to the Salvadoran guerrillas at the level of two to three a day to keep the guerrillas in the field, not to speak of Soviet bases nearby uh, for the proxy armies, collecting intelligence for the Salvadoran guerrillas through regular surveillance by, uh, by flights and off offshore naval vessels to facilitate terrorist attacks, running constant military maneuvers near the borders to force the country to remain under permanent mobilization in defense against an invasion threat, dominating much of Salvadoran radio and television with hostile propaganda and so on. And given the inability to conjure that up, you've got to do the best you can. Hence his grasping at the straw of Ortega's comment saying that there is no aid to the El Salvador guerrillas turned into uh, reconstructed in the required fashion to say that there is such aid. Well, Lemoyne has actually made a noble effort, got to admire it, to establish this uh, required symmetry uh, required for doctrinal reasons. In August 1987, he reported that though rebels in El Salvador deny receiving support from Nicaragua, quoting him, ample evidence shows it exists, and it is questionable how long they could survive without it. He presented no evidence, then or ever, uh, and he has yet to uh, comment on the fact that the State Department efforts to substantiate these claims are derisory and were dismissed by the World Court virtually without comment, but it's required for propaganda, so it's a fact. Uh, and the Times' efforts to protect this required fact are pretty intriguing. After Lemoyne's statement of alleged fact appeared, Fair wrote a letter to the Times asking him to share Lemoyne's ample evidence with the readers. The letter wasn't published, but they did receive a private response from the foreign editor, who acknowledged that there was no evidence uh, and that Lemoyne had been, as he called it, imprecise. Well, Lemoyne and the Times have had ample opportunity since to correct this imprecise report, and they've used it, namely to repeat the charges that they privately acknowledge to be without merit. Lemoyne does this regularly, either explicitly, as in the cases I mentioned and plenty of others, or implicitly in his constant reference to the alleged symmetry, uh, yeah, I'll hurry up, between uh, uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua, uh, uh, I will skip lots of other cases. There's case after case in which the Times since then has referred to these facts uh, as, uh, as, as, since they're required, they're therefore true. Uh, well, let, let me just finish up by asking how the U.S. government succeeded in imposing its required interpretation of the Central American Accords. It's really a brilliant example of the way the free press operates and fulfills its societal purpose. What, did, what was the shared consensus? What was the elite agenda? One, you have to demonize the Sandinistas. That was done completely. Two, you have to establish a symmetry between El Salvador and Nicaragua, and you have to place the whole conflict in a uh, Cold War context. That was achieved. Three, you have to contrast the four democracies with their elected leaders, uh, on the one hand with totalitarian Nicaragua, where there were no elections and where democratic rights uh, don't exist as we find in the military-run terror states. That was a complete success, which is an astonishing achievement if you look at the facts. Four, you have to eliminate the U.S. role in demolishing the Central American Accords by undermining the one indispensable element for peace. Remarkable success. Fifth, you have to focus the Accords solely on Nicaragua reinterpret them so that Nicaragua's compliance is non-compliance. Now that was actually achieved only in mid-January when Ortega agreed to go far beyond the accords, abandoning the simultaneity condition that was at the core of the agreement and agreeing that Nicaragua alone would uh, enact the provisions. There were headlines all over the U.S. press saying that Nicaragua now agrees to comply with the accords, though of course you can't trust them, meaning here the accords as they were fashioned in Washington and reiterated by the free press, which have no relation whatsoever to the text of the Accords, which has long been forgotten. 
So the simultaneity uh, structure, which is the core of the accords, that's out the window. Sixth, it's necessary to restrict all diplomacy and all monitoring to Central America to eliminate any international involvement. Reason, uh, Central American countries are weak. Uh, they're U.S. clients. They're subject to U.S. pressure. So there's no big problem. On the other hand, if you allow the Contadora countries and the UN and the OAS, you may not be able to boss them around totally. That, incidentally, is the reason why the press, why the United States has always been opposed to a Contadora agreement and why the press has suppressed most of the information about the Contadora history. Well, that result was also achieved uh, in January. Um, as you know, there was an International Commission of Verification, which was supposed to monitor the agreements. It submitted its report in January. That was the most important diplomatic event of January. Uh, they, that uh, report identified the United States as the primary violator of the accords. Uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, because of the, uh, the aid to the Contras, the supply flights and so on, uh, it also, uh, 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 I, it, it, the, the, there was a press conference and the members of the Verification Commission informed the press that they were unable to discuss the particular countries in Central America because Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador refused, which tells you exactly what they would have reported. Uh, a Latin American diplomat uh, informed the press that the Latin American members were shocked, I'm quoting, shocked by the attitudes of patent fear expressed by trade unionists and dissidents in El Salvador and Guatemala, obviously useless information. All of this was suppressed in the New York Times. The New York Times had one sentence referring to the Verification Commission report in a column by James Lemoyne, in which he said, falsely as in fact, uh, that there was no agreement. Well, the falsification is minor. What's much more significant is that all of that was eliminated. Uh, eliminated because it's just unacceptable uh, to the U.S. government, therefore it wasn't a fact. Uh, the commission was then disbanded. Uh, that leaves monitoring can completely in the hands of the Central American presidents, essentially in the hands of the United States, which can be pretty sure of lining them up. The unacceptable participation of independent elements is therefore excluded. That demolishes another central element of the Accords. Uh, recall that this is a triumph of the free press, which is performing its societal functions. Well, my intention originally was to go on with the New York Times for another couple of weeks, but I'll skip that. Uh, let me, it's about the same story as we continue, and the rest of the press is not all that different. Uh, let me just finally say that these impressive achievements of the free press are by no means unprecedented. The press has helped in the past uh, to undermine and destroy peace agreements and accords by shaping them into an instrument of U.S. policy. Uh, what we're discussing here is systematic institutional behavior. It's on a par with the commitment of corporations to maximizing profit and market share. That's why the pattern is so pervasive. That's why it's going to remain so, in essence, until the society itself undergoes a significant degree of democratization. Thanks. Join C-SPAN on Monday morning for a live viewer call-in program looking at media coverage of major events with particular focus on bias and accuracy through content analysis. Among our guests will be fairness and accuracy in reporting executive director Jeff Cohen. We'll also talk with L. Brent Bozell III, publisher of Media Watch. That's Monday morning on C-SPAN, beginning at 8 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. <laughs>